So welcome back everybody to another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. We're very happy to have Chad Jones with us from Stanford. Hi, Chad. Marcus, thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you. We will learn today about the AI dilemma, growth versus existential risk. So we will learn more about artificial intelligence and to what extent human beings or human mankind is threatened by existential risk. Before we go to Chad, let me just give some opening remarks. I would like to relate the existential risk a little bit to resilience because existential risk is essentially you, everything collapses and you can't bounce back. And resilience is exactly the opposite. There's a shock and then you can actually come back. So collapses can happen. You have a shock and then you're trapped. You can't bounce back like in this figure here where you, send this, you have a shock and then you're trapped and can't bounce back and follow this resilient path, which is you know risky, but has a high expected growth rate. And the other one is riskless, but you don't hit the trapping point. Even worse than a trap is essentially a tipping point where you hit a tipping point and then you get in some adverse feedback loop or some spirals and then the whole thing gets much, much worse subsequently. That's probably really, truly an existential risk as well. And that's essentially, you know, these two concepts are tightly connected in this sense, or at least that's what I, I think. Uh, and then the question is a little bit also, you know, how resilient is a system, how resilient is society, and to what extent it depends on the speed of transition. And there's a lot of talk that we actually have to slow down the artificial intelligence inventions. And the underlying assumption is that if you slow it down, we will create actually less existential risk, or we create some re-resilience in a sense that we can actually bounce back. And if it goes too fast, we can't. And I think it what depends a lot how quickly we can respond to essentially the developments and how we respond. So if we respond in a way which actually stabilizes the system, we lean against the shock, then actually slowing it down helps. But sometimes the ability to respond in time might also lead to amplification that we make a situation even worse. And then actually slowing it down might be counterproductive. So that's essentially a very important policy debate at this stage. Another thing I would like to relate to is how to aggregate things from individual resilience or some individual existential risk individuals have to the whole system or the whole society or whole humanity in a sense. And so you can think of individual resilience and you have a particular utility function. And then, you know, how does this aggregate to a repressive agent a utility function? And it could be that, you know, a system is very resilient and it's particularly resilient when a subsystem is not so resilient. So think about the economy. If you don't allow zombie firms, you make certain firms go bankrupt, it makes the whole economy more resilient, but each new firm is probably less resilient. So there you can have systems where subsystems are less resilient or more threatened by existential firm risk, let's say, and that makes the whole economy more resilient and less threatened by existential risk. But I guess uh, what people often have in mind is about existential risk that the whole humanity is wiped out and, but if let's say only 10% of the population dies after a shock and 90% can live forever or can get much higher consumption afterwards, should we do that? So if, if you ask people, you know, 10% of the population dies and 90% have a higher consumption, probably would say morally, that's not really justified. But if they can live much longer, and I think uh, Jet will talk about this as well. But in what... Generally, I think the aggregation of the utility, individual utility functions, how this aggregates them to a society welfare function, I think is a very interesting problem itself um, in order to, to study this. And there's, of course, a huge literature also in preference on diversity, biodiversity, and things, all of this, it comes also into play in, in this context. Um, finally, I would like to relate the AI risk to other risks we are facing, other existential risk in the sense of climate change or nuclear proliferation risk and uh, nuclear war risk. And it would be nice to figure out, learn more about the similarities and differences across uh, them. And one paper which comes to my mind is often uh, Marty Weitzman's paper where he studied climate risks, where essentially because you have some tail risk and because of the tail risk, it changes the discount rate, how we discount things. And this could be also with AI risk, but the nature is a little bit different. It's not something which is slowly always around, I guess. That's very much when you deduce the artificial intelligence, there's a transition phase where actually the highest risk of concentration is. So that's 
uh, it would be nice to, to figure out, I mean, these are open questions, everything. It's a very exciting new field uh, to figure this out. And I guess many people, when they talk about artificial intelligence, they're related to, you know, developing an atomic bomb and all these things. And, you know, the one big difference, I guess, is that the proliferation is much easier to control for the atomic bomb, uh, while for artificial intelligence might be easier. Or on the other hand, you know, open AI had to invest billions to, to get things where it does now, but it might, must be becoming cheaper down the road. But with this opening remarks, let me conclude the opening remarks with uh, the poll questions uh, Chad put forward and your answers. We're always grateful for your answers. So the first question is Chad was asking, what is the probability that technology improvements such as artificial intelligence will raise the average growth rate of the US GDP per person to more than 5% per year for at least a decade during the next 50 years? 50 years is a long time. Um, Less than 5% probability is at 22%. Between 5 and 20% probability is 44%. Between 20 and 40% is 20%. And more than 40%, 15%. So that was the first question. So the majority was 5. So most people thought 5 to 20% probability that for 50 years we will have a growth rate more than 5%, which is, I would say, a very positive perspective. Um, the second question was uh, similar. What's the probability that AI model will be used for bad purposes in a way that causes the S&P 500 index to decline by more than 15% on a given day during the next decade? Of course, S&P 500 can crash for other reasons too, but that's uh, for AI models. And so less than 5% probability at 14%. Between 5 and 20% probabilities, that's 48%, so almost half said five and 20, between 5 and 20% probability. And 20 and 40% probability is 24%, and more than 40% probability is at 14%. So again, 14, 48, 24, 14% percent is the distribution. And finally, what is the probability that the future AI will lead to a death will cause the death of more than 50% of the world's population to the next century. Okay, that's really the existential risk now we are talking about. How big is that? Less than 5%, so 60%. So, and I've read on Twitter, so of course I'm following very closely all the AI debates uh, as I, everybody's excited and me included. Uh, and it, it says that economists typically are very optimistic. And here they chose two, more than 60% thought it's, the probability is less than 5%. Between 5 and 20%, that's 22% of the audience thought this way. Between 20 and 60%, 6%, and above 40%, 13%. These are the really uh, very pessimistic outlook for 13%. But most of the economists in the audience here, I guess mostly of us are economists, they are thought be less than 5%. So with this positive outlook or less existentially threatened outlook, I leave the floor to Chad, who will, you know, provide us some theoretical uh, concepts, how to think about this introducing artificial intelligence, you know, should we introduce or not under what circumstances, and how can you think about that? And Chad, the floor is yours. We're looking forward to your presentation. Wonderful. Well, thank, thanks very much, Marcus. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the, the poll results. I'll kind of comment on those uh, as we go through. One thing to just say is a, a, a brand new paper. I've presented it to some of my colleagues here at Stanford, but otherwise not presented yet. So I'm very happy to have this opportunity to, to share it with you and, and get lots of valuable feedback. Um, so things are definitely definitely preliminary here. Um, so, so as everyone knows, you can't open Twitter or browse the web uh, or, or just about anything these days without encountering uh, some some view about you know Chat GPT or language models. And I, I think a thing that distinguishes it from other sort of serious risks like the the atomic bomb or nuclear weapons is the sort of dual nature, the double-edged nature of AI technology, which is on the one hand, some people emphasize the incredible benefits that could come, faster economic growth or even a singularity. Um, and on the other hand, you know, people emphasize the existential risk, the possibility that you know it, it could become more intelligent than we are, and that might not end well for, for, uh, for, for humans. Um, 
I'll have to say, I, I think, you know, both of these things, I think what makes AI special is it has both of these possibilities and they're both extreme possibilities. I mean, faster economic growth is, is incredible. I, I've written a lot of growth models and in the growth models that I write down, it's remarkably hard to raise the growth rate. The growth rate for the last 150 years in the US has been 2% per year, plus or minus a little bit. We don't have a decade other than maybe, you know, recoveries from a great depression or a really bad event. We don't have a decade where growth rates are more than 3%. And so getting a decade where growth rates are more than five, you know, would, would be a, a, a remarkable outcome and maybe even more is possible. Now, interestingly, um, I've written down some models with uh, Philippe Aguillon and Ben Jones, where we thought about AI and growth. And the surprising thing to me was that even though in most of the models I write down, it's very hard to raise the growth rate, in those models, it was possible to raise the growth rate. So if AI can uh, take over some of the tasks that people do when they're inventing new ideas, that can make us more productive at, at inventing ideas and allow people to focus on more of the bottlenecks. and that can raise the growth rate. And if that if that automation of tasks, if AI can do uh, most of the tasks, it doesn't even have to be 100%, you can get a singularity. You can get infinite income in finite time. And so, you know, a surprise is that even in models where I'm pretty pessimistic about the, the ability to raise growth, AI can raise growth. So I think this is a possibility worth taking seriously. Uh, and certainly there's some, some advocates who say, you know, this is this is a huge potential benefit. Um, again, you think about electricity, or you think of semiconductors or the internet itself, none of those were able to raise growth rates by 5% for a decade to 5% for a decade. Um, but AI could could be different. So so great possibilities could await. That's that's one of the sides of the, the technology. On the other hand, uh their experts, um, you know, including, you know, leaders at OpenAI or, uh, you know, Google or, or other places who take the existential risk very seriously and might put that probability as high as, you know, some people say it's as high as, you know, 80% or, or, or even higher. So um, I would put myself in the one to 5% category probably right now, but I'm very open-minded about it. And, you know, I think 40% of, of our participants thought it was greater than 1%. And you know, greater than one percent of killing off half the world's population—that's a serious risk already. And and you know, some AI experts think it could be even worse than that. So the the question of this paper is: Okay, if you've got this remarkable technology that could lead to amazing economic growth, but could kill us all, what do you do? How do you make those trade-offs? Should we shut AI down, or should we, or should we celebrate it? Um, so the the paper consists of two models. Both pretty simple, but one I'll call simple, really simple, and one you know less simple. And, and these models are to, to sort of highlight some of the trade-offs and help us think about it. They're kind of back of the envelope calculations to think about this trade-off. The simple model has a nice, very intuitive solution that is great for looking at the intuition. It requires you to calibrate the existential risk. So you have to take a stand on what the existential risk is in the simple model, which is not great, but you get nice expressions. The richer model, um, you don't have to calibrate the existential risk. I'm going to characterize a cutoff. And if, if the existential risk is worse than this cutoff, then we don't do it. If it's better than the cutoff, then we do do it. Um, so that, that's that's nice. The expressions are less, uh, you know, less, less simple and elegant. Uh, but we can also consider singularities in the richer model and uh, mortality improvements, which Marcus alluded to. Uh, and that these will, these will turn out to be important. So the, the goal here is not to provide a firm answer. There's just way too much uncertainty to be able to do that. But the thing that surprised me, I think, is when I wrote down these models, it highlighted interesting forces and kind of surprising considerations that I hadn't thought of. So, so that's where I think the, the value is in the exercise. Um, there's a literature on, on all these topics. In the interest of time, let me skip it over. But um, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure I, I at least put that up. Okay, so 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 let me talk about the the simple model first. So the simple model, there's just one th one decision to be made, which is how intensively do you want to use the AI? And think about this as cap T, and I'm using T to to indicate like think about it as how many years do you want to use the AI? I'm going to make it a static model, so that's not going to be literally correct, but I'm going to model it as if it's you know, how many years do you want to use the AI? So, so in the simple model, you can use the AI just a little bit, or you can use the AI a lot. And the longer you use it, the higher is your consumption. 
the, the more you, you can take advantage of this rapid consumption growth, but the more you use it, the, the riskier it is. So th that's going to be the trade-off. So consumption is going to be growing at rate G for every year you use the AI. And think of G as some number like 10%. So you know, let, let's give the benefit of the doubt to the, the AI optimists who think, yeah, it could raise the growth rate to 10%. Um, if you want to use 5%, that's fine as well. Um, but so, so the upside is this fantastic growth if we use the AI. The downside is that the probability that we 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 uh, you know die is delta per unit of time, and so the probability you survive for t periods, if you run it for t periods, the probability you survive is e to the minus delta t. Okay. Uh, to simplify things further, let's assume all the growth and all the existential risk occurs immediately. So it's really just kind of a static model. Okay. So if you survive, you get to consume CT forever. Okay. So you use the AI intensively and in kind of the, at the beginning of time, and then the existential risk is realized and you either live or die. If you live, you get to have this really high level of consumption because you grew at 10% per year for, well, how many years? T is the, is the choice variable here. Okay, we've got n people, and so the social welfare function I'm going to use is just very standard. Add up the the utility from everyone who's alive and discount the future at rate rho. Okay, and because c is going to be constant, this is just n times u of c divided by rho. Divided by rho takes the present discounted value, and then we want to choose t, how intensively to use this AI, how many years to run it to maximize expected social welfare, which is just going to be the probability you survive times the, the utility you get if you survive. So it's e to the minus delta t times n over rho u of c0 e to the gt, right? So the trade-off is the growth versus the risk, exactly the, uh, the two things that we think are, are first-order considerations for the AI. You know, just also a clarifying question. So Please. if you choose, you can choose here the cap T, how long you will introduce that. Is the same as the choosing the intensity? Let's suppose I can only introduce it half in, with a half. Yeah, rate. yeah, yeah, exactly. Think think about it as, as choosing the intensity. Do you want to use it a lot or a little? And that's mm -hmm. what, you know, cap T is. And I'm just scaling the benefits and the costs in this per year sense of say, you know, 10% growth and 1% probability of dying for every year you use it. But yeah, you, you'll see everything just depends on the ratio of G over D and so, or G over delta. And so- uh, But it, yeah. the, the key assumption is that it's not somehow convex in the intensity or if I use it a lot and it, it's going linearly up in the existential risk is going up linearly, this is correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's think about it as 1% per year. So if you use it for one year, it's a 1% risk, 40 years, it's a, you know, e to the minus delta t. So there's some, some curvature there, but you can think of it as a 40% risk. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Um, uh, okay, so the, the first order condition turns out, and I'll go through this more on the next slide, v of c equals g over delta. Okay, so v of c is going to be an important uh, uh, concept here. It's u of c, the, the utility you get from living for a period divided by u prime of cc, okay? And so the right thing to do is to choose the level of consumption such that this value of life, again, I'll talk more about it on the next slide, equals g over delta. g over delta, I'm going to call the AI benefit cost ratio because it's the, the benefit g divided by the cost delta. Notice, by the way, that it doesn't depend on n or rho. So, you know, and, and one way to think about, you, you might have thought, you know, the sort of, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the sort of long-termism view that says, hey, the future, we've got, you know, potentially a, a thousand years of the future to consider, doesn't that enter the trade-off somehow? Here it doesn't. And it's kind of interesting. It's that the costs and the benefits apply symmetrically to every generation, right? If we get the fast growth and we live, we all get higher consumption. If we the existential risk is realized on the wrong side, then we all die. And so the n and the row just drop out from the calculation. Um, uh, all right, so, so let me talk more about the intuition for this equation, v of c equals g over delta. So v of c is, uh, so u of c is the value of a year of life in utils. You divide by the marginal utility of consumption to put it in consumption units. So now it's the value of a year of life in dollars, and then express it as a ratio to per capita consumption itself. So it's going to be the value of a year of life 
as a ratio to, per, to the per capita consumption. So let me show you some, some numbers from, from today. So, you know, David Cutler, the health economics literature, there's a huge, huge literature using these value of life numbers. And the kind of typical numbers you see are that a year of life for kind of a middle-aged American is, is worth $250,000, okay? Per capita consumption is $40,000. So $250,000 divided by 40 is a number like six, right? So a year of life is worth six times per capita consumption in the US today, okay? And that's, that's sort of a, a benchmark number that um, I've got a couple of other papers and we get very similar numbers for, for this today. And it's exactly the sort of value of a year of life, 150, 200,000, $250,000 divided by per capita consumption. So numbers like five or six for the US are, are, are very, very common here. Okay, so the, the first order condition says, uh, use the AI uh, until the value of life expressed relative to consumption is G over Delta, or a, a better way to look at it is in this second bullet point here, you use the AI as long as Delta times V is smaller than G, okay? so. Delta is the probability we're going to you know, kill off some people. V is the value of the lives that we kill off. And so delta times V is kind of the, uh, the value of the lost lives at the margin, right? And G is the value of the gain from consumption. So if you run the AI for one more period, you're going to kill off some people at rate delta. The value of those lost lives is V, the value of life. And since we're looking in growth rates, that's why you want to scale it by consumption. So divide by C, and then you compare that to the growth rate. Okay. Um, and again, I'm going to call G over delta the AI benefit cost ratio. All right. So, so, so to go further with this, we need to make some assumptions about the functional form for utility so we can get V of C and then invert it to solve for uh, you know, how long we want to run the AI. And I'm going so, to use sort of so every agent in this economy has the same preferences. So each Decision every agent is agrees with this decision at all or not? Yeah, this is very much a representative agent problem. Everyone agrees. Yeah, there's no uh, yeah, there's no time consistency or, or heterogeneity. I'll come back to the heterogeneity. The heterogeneity, okay. I think, is really important potentially. But I'm gonna for now. Uh, uh, so if I know I'm more likely the one who is dying, I might have different preferences now. I, I, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, you know, that that's the, the heterogeneity I'm going to highlight is different, um, but I agree with your header. The heterogeneity I'm going to highlight is uh, people are have different income levels and they may feel differently about uh, risks. Uh, so I'll come back to that. Um, okay, so constant relative risk conversion utility, what we use to study everything in economics, asset pricing, macroeconomics, labor supply, et cetera. So U of C is C to the one minus gamma over one minus gamma plus U bar. This U bar is gonna play an important role. And I'll highlight for you on the next slide exactly what it's doing. It'll be very clear, um, but, but notice that, you know, the value of life depends on how many utils it's worth. And so adding a constant matters here because it's, you know, it, it, it's lives. Uh, yeah, yeah, you'll, you'll see. But this um, gamma has two meanings. It's the risk aversion coefficient, but also the one over gamma is the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. In your model, it's the latter, which or what? Yeah, in my model, it's the latter. Really what it's doing, you, you can make this a static, you could do a, a version of this that's purely static where there's no intertemporal substitution. It's really how quickly does the marginal utility of consumption fall? Okay. okay. That's related to risk aversion and related to intertemporal substitution, but that the economic force here is just, how quickly does margin utility fall? That's literally what's going on. So you can even do it without, without intertemporal substitution, uh, but obviously they're, they're closely related. And then if gamma equals one, it's log utility, okay? So first thing, let's compute the V of C for this utility function. So U of C divided by U prime of CC is U bar C to the gamma minus one plus one over one minus gamma, or in the, the log case is easy, right? U prime of CC is just one, so V of C is U of C. So an interesting thing here is you might ask, when we assume log utility, what, what are the units of utils that we're talking about? Well, here, what it says is that the units of utils are the value of life measured as a ratio of consumption, right? Because uh, U prime of C, C is one. The interesting thing I wanna highlight now, and I'll, I'll walk you through more examples of this in a second, is notice for gamma bigger than or equal to one, even, even equal to one, the value of life rises rises with consumption, 
okay? And it rises even as a ratio to consumption with consumption, right? As we get richer, life becomes increasingly valuable. And with gamma greater than one, the income effect dominates the substitution effect in some sense. This will be again clearer on the next slide. And so life gets increasingly valuable even relative to consumption. Okay? And I've made a big deal out of that and other people have too in other papers like on health spending as a share of GDP uh, or, 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 or other things, okay? So the so let me show you is gamma is very a lot, whether it's the IES or the risk aversion no? in your setting, if, when you calibrate it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so so for, this is where asset pricing people and macroeconomists differ a little bit. So macroeconomists are comfortable with gamma equals one or two and having it be, you know, constant relative risk aversion and asset pricing people want Epstein's in and want to think about, you know, uh, different values of sigma, is sigma bigger than one or less than one, it's less clear for, for you guys, I guess. Um, here, it's definitely going to matter. And I'm going to focus on the case where, you know, it's log or more curved than log in terms of the rate at which marginal utility falls. And you'll you, you'll see what happens on the other side. I'll, I'll do all the cases in some sense, but th those are the cases that macroeconomists tend to emphasize. And, um, you know, why is health spending as a share of GDP rising? Um, in some sense, gamma bigger than one gives you an explanation, and you'll kind of see that on the next slide. So let me show you what, what U of C looks like for gamma bigger than one, right? For gamma bigger than one, flow utility is bounded, right? And the upper bound is that constant U bar that I added to the utility function, okay? So take, take gamma equals two, C to the one minus gamma over one minus gamma is negative one over C. So utility, if we set u bar equals zero, utility is bounded at zero and it's negative. Well, remember when I wrote down this problem, I implicitly normalized the value of death to be zero, right? I said, if you live, you get u of c, and if you die, you get zero. Well, that means u of c had better be positive, otherwise we all wanna die immediately. So this is an example of why the constant u bar matters here. So you need a parameter there to tell you how valuable is life with infinite consumption relative to death? Death gives you zero. How valuable is life with infinite consumption? And you can see now, I'm gonna come back to this later, but singularities with gamma bigger than one, utilities bounded. And so you, you, infinities don't show up as much as you might've thought if, if gamma is bigger than one. Um, okay, with gamma bigger than one, bounded utility, marginal utility consumption is falling very, very quickly. And that's why, the value of life rises uh, with consumption if gamma is bigger than one, uh, weakly bigger than one, even, even with log utility, it rises, right? And so what it's saying is that, you know, we get saturated in consumption. U of C is really sharply curved. As we get richer, we're saturated in consumption. And what we need are more days of life to enjoy our high living standards. That's the nature of our standard assumptions about utility. Right? It's not often thought about that way, but that's exactly what we're assuming when we say gamma is greater than or equal to one. Okay. All right, so, so now let me just plug in some numbers just to illustrate some points. And um, you know these are kind of made up numbers, but they do illustrate some useful points. So, so for growth, let me set G equals 10%. Um, again, everything sort of scales. So it just depends on G over Delta. So I'm gonna say, uh, you know, 10% it, 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 is, is really high, but maybe it takes seriously the optimistic claims that AI could really change the way uh, the economy works. The existential risk, let me consider one or 2%. So the AI benefit cost ratio is gonna be 10 or five. And this is just helpful for illustrating a point. And then um, we won't have to make these assumptions about Delta in, this, in the second model. Um, okay, recall V of C today in the US is some number like six. And let me normalize, we could choose the units of consumption. It's helpful to choose the units of consumption so that consumption today is one. So that $40,000, let's just measure everything in $40,000 units. So consumption today is one. Okay, so let me look at the case where Delta is 1% to begin. So G is 10%. So the AI benefit cost ratio is 10, right? Every year you run it, you get a 10% growth rate, but a 1% chance of destroying the world. Well, V of C should equal 10 over one, 10. So you wanna run the AI until consumption rises enough so that V of C equals 10. 
I told you VFC today is six. The value of life is six years of consumption today. And we want to run it until the value of life is 10 years of consumption because the you know, AI is pretty beneficial here relative to the cost, to the existential risk delta. Well, with log utility, V of C is U bar plus log of C. So if we want V of C to go from six to 10, we want the log of C to rise by four. Log of C rising by four is amazing economic growth, right? Because E to the four is 55, right? So with, with G equals 10 and Delta equals one, the model wants you to run the AI for 40 years, right? It's 10% growth. You want to raise, uh, you know, C by, log C by four. So it takes 40 years to do that. E to the four is 55. So we start out with consumption equal to one, and we run the AI until we're 55 times richer than we are today. That's astounding economic growth. So one, one way to put it in context, for the last 150 years, we're roughly 20 times richer than we were 150 years ago. The US today is maybe 55 times richer than the poorest countries of the world or than the poorest countries that have ever existed, right? So this is the difference between the US and the poorest countries of the world or the US and you know, the world 2000 years ago, right? So it's astounding economic growth. You run the AI for 40 years with 10% growth a year to get consumption raised by a factor of 55. What's the probability that you kill everyone well, it's 1% per year for 40 years. It's like a 40% risk. When you apply the E to the minus delta T, it's a 33% risk, right? There's a, with log utility, this is the first surprising thing. With log utility, we're willing to take a one in three chance of killing everyone in order to raise consumption by a factor of 55. So you're really seeing both extremes of, the, of this knife edge. It's astounding economic growth, with a pretty high existential risk. And so if your view is the existential risk is, you know, 5% or even 10%, you would say, if you had log utility, you would say those, those risks are worth taking here. Okay. So the first surprise to me, I, I would have never thought it was so big. And, and when I do introspection, I think this tells me I'm not a log utility person, right? I, I think I worry more about the risks than, uh, than this suggests. Um, so what if we do gamma equals two? With gamma equals two, V of C is, remember it's U bar C to the gamma minus one. Gamma minus one is two minus one or one. So the value of life is, is linear in consumption. U bar is some number like six, or it's actually seven here, because remember I took, you know, C is equal to one and V is six. So U bar is actually seven when gamma equals two. So if U bar is seven, then to get V of C to go from six to 10, we just have to increase C by 57%. So we run the AI for four years now, instead of 40 years, consumption rises by 57%. This is 10% you know, per year for four and a half years, but this is a hundred fold less increase than what we had with log utility. Gamma equals one versus gamma equals two, it's a hundred fold difference in the percentage change in, in consumption. And the existential risk is 1% per year, so roughly 4% here, right? So you can see the difference between gamma equals one and gamma equals two is just incredibly profound. With gamma equals two, you're pretty conservative. With gamma equals one, you're pretty generous toward the AI risk. And so the second sort of surprising point to me was just how, how big a difference it makes, gamma equals one versus gamma equals two. Um, and obviously, if gamma is three or more, you know, it, it's just, you know, it, it cuts it even more, right? You run it for two years rather than four years, or you can, you can scale it up. Um, okay, next point, what if delta is 2% instead of 1%, right? I don't know what the existential risk is per, per for every 10% growth, do we have a 1% chance of dying or a 2% chance of dying? That's within the, certainly within the realm of my enormous uncertainty about this. But if it's 2%, notice the AI benefit cost ratio is now five instead of 10, but V is already six. And so if the existential risk were two instead of one, this says don't run it at all. We're already pretty rich. We're already at V equals six. And this says you only use it if V is below five. And so this is saying, look, 
life is already too valuable relative to the AI existential risk, and so we don't want to run it at all. So that's kind of the, the, the other interesting point here is that, you know, we have a lot of uncertainty about what Delta is, but, you know, this is not, a, we're doubling Delta, so this is not a small change in Delta, but within the realm of uncertainty, you could be run the thing for 40 years and get a 55-fold increase in consumption if Delta's one with log utility, or don't run it at all if Delta's two. Okay, so uh, it's very sensitive there as well. To understand some of what's going on, it's helpful to plot the value of life. So this is this V of C function, and I'm showing it to you for gamma equals one, two, and three, okay? So consumption is on the horizontal axis. It's a linear scale. Consumption units today, remember I said I picked one, and I told you V of C today is six, so that's the US today. And uh, let's look at what V of C looks like for gamma equals one, two, and three. For gamma equals one, it's just the log of consumption. For gamma equals two, it's linear in consumption. And for gamma equals three, it's quadratic. It, it rises C to the gamma minus one, right? So uh, obviously, you know, gamma equals five is gonna make it even steeper. The interesting thing in this problem, remember, is we wanna run it until V rises to equal 10, where it's six today, we run it until V equals 10, and you can, so when it intersects with the orange, blue, and green lines, and what this emphasizes is that log is just incredibly flat. This is something we all know, but it's just, you know, C to the power of zero essentially is log. And it, you have to raise C to 55 before this thing ever crosses 10 if we're log utility. Whereas if we're gamma equals two, it's you know 57%. If we're gamma equals three, it's 25%, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So um, it matters a lot what the value of gamma is. The other point I wanted to make here is to come back to Marcus's question about heterogeneity. Right. And there are two kinds of heterogeneity you could think about. You could think about people differ in their risk aversion. Clearly, people with log utility want to run this thing like crazy, and people with gamma equals two or three or five are much, much more conservative. So that's the first kind of heterogeneity. The other heterogeneity that I think in this case to me is more interesting is the heterogeneity uh, by income, right? So this is average income per person is one, but there's heterogeneity. Some people are a lot richer than average. They're gonna be very conservative. If their gamma equals two, then you don't wanna run it, right? If you're 57% richer than the average, you say, don't do it if your gamma is two. On the other hand, if your V is one, so if you're a poor person in the United States or an average person in you know, many of the poorest countries of the world, you say, hey, our V is really, really low. We want to run the thing for 100 years, right? If it's 10% per year and you need to go from 1 to 10 or 90 years, right? You want to run the thing a lot, right? And so rich people are the ones who should be conservative. Risk-averse people should be conservative. And poor people might really want to use this technology. And you can see how this V of C function really, really changes with consumption, especially depending on the value of gamma. So Just heterogeneity does matter a lot here. Yeah, go ahead. So one thing you're saying essentially that the emerging economy should push the AI much more than the US. You know, that's right. China might be putting more in it, more resources behind that. Yeah, that's right. The, the way to think about it, you know, if, if you want to get to, you know, um, say you're the log utility people, you want to be 55 times richer than we are today. Let me just round things off. We're $100,000 today. You, you want to get to $5 million per person, right? So if you're, a, everyone's going to go to V equals 10, everyone wants to go to $5 million per person. And if you're a poor country, you know, that's a long way from where you are. And so you're really willing to, to, to run this a lot. Um, so typically we have this constant relative risk of where we say, okay, it's independent of the income essentially do you have a similar concept here there's a certain gamma where it doesn't matter what the income is you can't um it, this would it, be, it, would it, be it, it almost city. always matters it's, so if you take square root of c for example mm -hmm. if if u of c is the square root of c then v of c is always two mm -hmm. okay it's the inverse of the you know it's it's, it's one over the, 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 the exponent there one over one half mm -hmm. um but even there you'd want to add a u bar because of the units of consumption and the value of life would fall as you get richer there. So if the U bar is zero and you've got power utility, 
uh, you know, where, where gamma is less than one in some sense, so the square root or the cube root, then V of C would be two or three. Um, but once you add a consumption, then as you get richer, um, you, you, that life would become less valuable. Um, so there's some comments in the chat, let me just say, so essentially what you assume is that the, the delta for the rich and the poor is the same across the countries. It might be very different. I guess. The delta, is that what you said? The delta and also the benefit of the rich and the poor people. So it might be the rich people benefit more than the poor. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's just, right. Yeah, suppose the AI just helps the rich and doesn't help the poor. That would be different. Yeah, the delta I'm thinking of as an existential risk. And so it really it yes. kind of applies to everyone. But um, yeah, you might you might think, you know, if you ask which way does that go, you might think the rich countries have the higher risk because we're the ones inventing the AI. And so maybe, you know, maybe people in very poor countries um, are further removed from the AI and have less existential risk, that would make them want to use it even more. So uh, yeah, I do, I do think that kind of heterogeneity is potentially interesting. Okay, so so you've seen the first two, two results. Let me not summarize them because I think you understand and I have a slide at the end to summarize. Let me turn now to the richer model. And this is gonna allow us to relax some assumptions and bring in some other forces that I haven't highlighted so far. So for the richer model, I wanna add the fact that the AI could lead to a singularity, infinite consumption and finite time. The model's gonna work fine with that, interestingly. And I wanna add mortality improvements. Um, and you know, one, one way to think about that is if the AI can generate new ideas that are sufficient to raise economic growth to 10% per year, well, it's probably also going to help us cure cancer and heart disease and other things and raise life expectancy, right? If you're inventing ideas that let us grow at 10%, some of those ideas are going to be life-saving ideas. And the, the, the insight that's going to emerge is that mortality and existential risk are in the same units. And so it's going to, that mortality improvement is going to really matter here. Um, okay. So the second model is, is similar to the first model. I'm gonna look at lifetime utility and there's a mortality rate M that everyone faces, right? Constant probability of death, right? M per period. Consumption grows at rate G over time. And I'm only gonna look at the gamma greater than one case here just to keep it simple, but I'll, I'll let gamma be close to one and I'll I'll, I'll show you what, what happens in the other cases, but this is a, a useful place to start. Can I Should just have use... a clarification Sorry. question? Yeah, you said earlier in the, in the simple model, the rho doesn't matter, but now essentially you replace rho with plus m and the m matters now. Um, well, because I'm going to change m. I'm going to let the AI change m. And so oh, okay. it's, it's going to matter that way. Um, yeah, the, the rho is going to matter a little bit here in a way that it didn't matter before, but uh, you'll, you'll see that in a second. Okay, so the question is, should we use the AI or not? If you shut it down, we grow at 2% per year and face our usual mortality rate, let's say 1% per year. If we use the AI, it raises growth rates to G sub AI, and it lowers mortality rates potentially to some other mortality rate M sub AI, but it involves a one-time existential risk. So now I'm going to make the existential risk uh, just a one-time risk rather than a, a flow probability, okay? And uh, you'll, see, you'll see what difference that would make. So lifetime utility, if you grow at rate G with mortality rate M and constant relative risk aversion, uh, you can integrate that out to get the first equation. And the idea here is you're going to use the AI as long as one minus delta times N times U of the growth and mortality rates for the AI, where you adjust for the probability of that the world ends when you, when you switch the AI on, as long as that's bigger than the baseline, you use the AI. And if it's smaller than the baseline, you don't, right? So there's a cutoff delta star that's implicitly given by setting this equation to equality. And if delta is bigger than that cutoff, you shut it down. If delta is less than that cutoff, you use the AI. So the nice thing here is we don't have to take a stand on what the existential risk is. I can just say, here's the cutoff. And so you can figure out where your own belief is about the existential risk and decide whether we should turn still it on there. or not. But here right. it's still the case, it's like individually existential risk. No, it, it doesn't matter whether the whole human mankind is wiped out or each individual guy has an idiosyncratic. Yeah, th this is interesting. I've thought a little bit about this. Um, the way the problem is set up here, basically, if you if you have a 10% chance of dying, you don't care whether it's existential risk or your own mortality. And the planner doesn't either. 
right? Everything's linear in probabilities. So going back to the example you started with in, in your slides, if 10% of the population dies, that's equivalent to a one in 10 chance of everyone dying. Mm -hmm. Everything's linear in probabilities here. And it's worth thinking about um, how that might not be the case. I thought that Epstein's in would make that not the case, mm -hmm. but I'm not, I don't think so anymore. From an individual standpoint, if you have a 10% chance of dying, whether it's mortality or existential risk, those are equivalent to you. And so integrating over a bunch of people like that, th those two probabilities, you know, Epstein's in is going to not like that risk symmetrically. So uh, it's, it's. But, you know, in the real world, a social planner might care a lot whether human mankind is wiped out or people just die for two reasons, immortality and extent, individual and existential risk. Yeah, not, not if the social planner is a total utilitarian. If the social planner just adds up people's utility, then those two probabilities are the same from the social planner standpoint. Now, you, you might not want to do total utilitarian, but you have to depart from total utilitarian if you want those probabilities to be treated asymmetrically. So uh, I'm thinking about that. I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't figured out something that I want to say yet, but that's definitely on the list of things to think about. I agree. It's, it's very interesting. We all have the intuition that those two risks are very different, but interestingly, the way we write down our models, they're not. So uh, yeah, even with Epstein's in. Okay, so what is that cutoff? We need to, to solve for the cutoff. How am I doing on time? Okay, so um, let me introduce the singularity now. What if AI reduce, re results in a singularity? And again, you can I can write down growth models where this happens, even though I'm pretty conservative about you know the ability to raise growth rates. If AI can automate idea production, if machines can produce ideas, well, then, you know, we're in, in my models, we're limited by the number of people who can produce ideas. If machines can produce ideas and ideas can produce machines, then you get this virtuous circle that gives you explosive growth potentially. So, so that can happen. The, the insight here is if gamma is bigger than one, well, utility is bounded anyway. So the most you are going to get is that U bar. And so if you're a little less than U bar, it just doesn't make any difference. So it's going to turn out the singularity versus 10% growth, they're pretty much the same if gamma is two or three or four, okay? So you can, you can integrate that. And you know before we had U bar over rho plus M and C zero to the one minus gamma, now C zero is infinite, but gamma is bigger than one. And so this just becomes a zero. So you're just left with that, that first term. Okay, and then let me make, suppose AI doesn't improve mortality just to make the solution simple. Here's the formula for the cutoff. And you can see if life is more valuable, then that lowers the cutoff. If gamma is higher, Mars utility falls more quickly, that lowers the cutoff. If the economy without AI grows faster, that lowers the cutoff. If rho plus M is higher, that raises the cutoff because that means you sort of benefit from normal growth for less time in some sense. But you can, you, know, you, can, you can get a formula, but I've, I've had to make a bunch of assumptions to get the formula and it's, it's less, uh, less elegant than the other thing I had. Okay, so, so now let me plug in some numbers. Okay, so what are the cutoffs? What are the delta star such that if mortality, if existential risk is higher than delta star, you don't use the AI. If it's below delta star, you do use the AI. And let me shut off the mortality advantage for the moment. So MAI and M0 are the same. And then I'll consider the AI raises growth rates to 10% or the AI delivers a singularity. All right, so first log utility. So gamma equals 1.01, so we're very close to log. Notice 35%, the cutoff is 35% with 10% growth. That's very much like the simple model. You remember the simple model I said, there's a one in three chance of destroying everyone, okay, that's kind of appearing, appearing here too. Interestingly, if there's a singularity and utility is not bounded, so log utility is not bounded, now basically, you know, if we went to log utility, anything short of certain annihilation, the, you know, the integral of infinity is infinity. So anything short of certain annihilation, you want to use the AI, right? So again, log utility is pretty weird here uh, relative to other things. So let me, you know, let me show you instead gamma equals two, right? Well, if gamma equals two, now we're on the green line. Okay, very much like the simple model, it says, okay, before in the simple model, it was a 4% chance of existential risk. Here, it's a 5% chance, but it's the, the same kind of thing. 
If gamma is three, it's a 2% chance, just like in the simple model. So we're, we're reinforcing the simple model uh, in this, this alternative model. And even the singularity doesn't make that much difference. The, the, the cutoff goes from 5% to 7%. And it's again, you know, utilities bounded. So 10% growth is driving us to that upper bound pretty quickly anyway. And so whether you get there immediately with infinite consumption doesn't make that much difference. With gamma equals three, it's 2% versus 2.6%. So that's kind of the, the third insight is that these singularities, these infinities, which you might've thought would make a big difference. Well, if you're on the margin utility falls very rapidly side of things anyway, there's nothing special about a singularity. G equals 10% is already uh, pretty impressive. Um, okay. And then finally, let me turn to the existential risk cutoffs with improvements in mortality. And here there's, there's, there's another surprise, right? So uh, the first column here is, is what I'd showed you already with M equals 1%. So with M equals 1%, you know, this constant probability of death, life expectancy is 100 years. And I'm supposing just for fun that AI that can generate 10% growth in per capita consumption can cut the mortality rate in half. So life expectancy is now 200 years, okay? Amazing growth probably does amazing things to life expectancy as well. How does that change the calculation? Well, what you can see is even, especially for gamma equals two and three, it really changes the calculation, right? So now look at gamma equals three, you were only willing to have a cutoff of 2%. Anything worse than a 2% risk, you don't do it. Now it's a 25, 26, 27% risk or a, a 29, 30% risk, right? And what's going on here? Why are you so willing to, to invest in the AI now when you weren't before? Well, it's, it's really, in, in the case of mortality, you're trading off lives versus lives, right? It's both in the same units. The existential risk and the mortality risk are both risks to lives, and so they don't run into that diminishing margin utility of consumption. What was driving the result before was lives versus consumption. When you're in lives versus consumption space, the fact that our utility is bounded, even log utility is pretty sharply curved, right? It just means, hey, we're saturated in consumption already. What we really care about is ensuring that we live a long time. Well, now we're trading off, how do you live a long time? Existential risk versus mortality. Those are in the same units. And so uh, you can get very high cutoffs. And if you, if you, you'll notice I, I, I set things up in this, um, uh, where did I do it here? Uh, this one-time existential risk, let me go back here, versus the you know, kind of Poisson process for mortality, you could I could have, like in the simple model, set up the existential risk as a e to the minus delta t, and then it would be you know, m plus delta t appearing in the e, and you see they're just perfect substitutes, right? All that matters is m plus delta not the composition of M versus Delta. So if Delta goes up by one and M goes down by one, you're willing to do that, right? Uh, or you're, you're, you're indifferent in that case, but if it were a little more, uh, you'd be willing to do that. Um, so, so, so that's kind of the, uh, uh, the, the, so can the I ask last... another question? Sorry, um, yeah, please. So here you take the social planner, you only take the living into account. But let's suppose we have an old G setting where new generations are born, people die and then, I guess if the mortality rate goes down, it's it's not clear, but then also the birth rate is going down. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's a great that question. Take into account as well. Uh, yeah, that, that can be taken about into the non-born citizens yet. You know. Yeah, the, the model already nests that. In fact, um, and I need to make that explicit. That's another thing that's on my on my list of things to make explicit. So one way to think about this is: imagine you put population growth in here. Yeah. Right. There's usually an e to the n t. Mm -hmm right, in, in this utility function, basically. So the N you can think of as births minus deaths, right? The birth rate minus the death rate. So think of the row, replace the row with a row plus, or it's a row minus B here, right? It's row minus B minus M. And so it's row minus B plus M. And so just row includes the birth rate. And then we're adding future generations at rate B, it just changes the row. And that you can see here, it is going to change the calculation here. So if you have faster population growth, you care more about the future, and that makes you you more conservative. It, it, it's going to, uh, yeah, because it's row minus n. Um, um, 
And so, so that would be true here, but it's it just shows up in the discount rate. And so that can be incorporated and it, it would quantitatively, you know, it's, it's just de depending on what value you pick for rho, it's, it's uh, isomorphic to rho. Um, yeah, but that's a, that's a good point because I, I think that's, that's worth making explicit because yeah, otherwise there's a tension like between individual decision making and then the social planners. Decision. Yeah, here I'm only looking at the social planner problem always. So I'm not looking at an individual problem. So the, the planner wants to take into account future generations. Um, absolutely. That's where, where that end would be coming from. So let me make a strange. So let's suppose AI makes it much easier to give birth and raising kids. Uh, you could do this too. In a sense. Yeah. You know, so, so in some of my other work, I've thought carefully about endogenous fertility because as I mentioned in, in my growth models, ideas come from people. Mm -hmm. And so the growth rate of ideas is tied to the growth rate of people. And because all of our income depends on ideas, the growth rate of income per person depends mm -hmm. on the growth rate of people. That's the, the key to growth. And in, in, I think that's, you know, in, in the models of growth that I write down. And so people really matter. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the world, the population growth rate is plummeting, yes. right? All the advanced countries of the world, Germany, you know, even the US, fertility rates are below replacement, right? Italy, China, Korea, Japan, advanced countries as a whole, women on average are having 1.7 kids rather than two kids. So we're below replacement, which mm -hmm. says in the long run, that means population growth would be negative rather than rather than zero or positive. And, and that to me was a, a, a real surprise. I mean, it's, it's totally obvious when you look at the data. So it just is a matter of appreciating the fact. I, I'd been accustomed to thinking about world population would level off at 10 billion, let's say. And I thought a little bit about what that means for growth. Um, but no, 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 it turns out there's nothing special to an individual family about having two kids. And you look at India or you look at the rest of the yeah. world and we go from five kids to four to three to two, and we just shoot Good right God. through two. The microeconomics, individual families, you know, tend to have 1.5 or 1.7 kids yeah. per, per family. But from the macro standpoint, that's the difference between positive population growth and negative population growth. It's the difference between exponential growth in living standards for an exponentially growing number of people. So do we grow at 2% forever and fill the world with people? Or it turns out if you put in negative population growth, which is kind of where we're headed, living standards stagnate for a population that vanishes. So this empty planet paper that I have a couple of years ago mm -hmm. kind of explored that. So to get to your question, if AI can make us produce mm -hmm. kids better, that yes. could be very good. Now, now notice in some sense, you don't, you, you no longer you need use kids to make ideas if the AI is already making ideas. Yes. So I think it, it kind of, that force becomes unnecessary, except that, you know, the, the social planner might like having lots of people around, right? A world with more people is better. And so the planner might like, like it if AI could help us make kids for that reason, not for the idea reason. Yeah, but I could also say the AI produces robots or something like that. And the social planner only cares about the humans to some extent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I, that's the more traditional view of things is that, that does, the, does the planner count uh, robots that are more intelligent than people? That's, uh, you know, that's a, that's an open question. Maybe not the human planner. Um, uh, um, so so basically, I, I, I'm done. Let me just summarize these last two points, then I'll- So I'll, we, can I'll tell, we go, can go a few minutes. Yeah, I only have two slides now. Anyway. Okay. So, right. so, so we're, we're kind of done. So- um, key point three was about singularities and key point four was about the mortality improvements. Actually, I think I summarized this uh, on, on this last slide. So, so to bring all this together, you know, the interesting thing about the AI technology, you know, we, we're used to thinking about iPhones that raise living standards or maybe nuclear weapons that kill a lot of people. And the interesting thing is that the AI does both and it might do both in an incredibly extreme way. So, 10% growth on the good side and kill all of humanity on the bad side. And so it's, 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 it has both of these features and they're both extreme. And so it's fun to think about those trade-offs. And that's kind of what I did in the paper. So a couple of key points, whether you've got log utility or gamma bigger than two matters a ton, right? With log utility, one in three chance of killing humanity to get a 55-fold increase in consumption is worth it. And you know, 
that that's the first surprising result. Gamma equals two, no, you kind of barely use it at all, right? So gamma bigger than or equal to two, we're very conservative if you're only looking at the consumption gains. Third point was singularities with, with unbounded utility, you do it even if there's only an epsilon chance of not annihilating everyone. Um, but with bounded utility, the singularity is not that special. And then the last point, it, which, which I think is the, you know, up until now, it looks pretty conservative. I, I you know, with, with the first three points, I come down saying, hey, I'm not sure we should use this. The last point makes me reconsider because whatever AI could do to invent ideas that could generate fast growth, it's going to help us on the mortality front too. And as lives become increasingly valuable, that's important. And, you know, then you're trading off lives versus lives. And, you know, taking a one in three chance of killing everyone versus everyone gets to double their life expectancy if they don't die immediately. You know, the model says those are, that's roughly an even trade off. And so your cutoffs might be much, much higher if the AI can extend life. Um, which, you know, again, if it can do all these great things with consumption, there's no reason to think. We're already seeing protein folding and, and other things. And so I think the, the, the expanding life is probably, you know, probably, probably something on the table. So anyway, that's it. Let me stop there. So I'm happy to take more questions. Turn it around a little bit. Would you survey people about the attitude towards AI and then elicit the gamma? Do you think that's a new way to elicit the gamma? Or do you think it's... It's not, I mean, it's very sensitive. So you will get a very precise number out of that, I guess. Yeah. Well, how, that's, how, how, what could you push it? That's, that, good that's a good question. I haven't thought about it that way. I, uh, I, I think, you know, the, to, to, to my mind, these deltas are the things that are really uncertain. And so, you know, if, I think if you, if you ask people, are you willing to do this or not, you know, 10% growth versus a, you know, 1% flow probability, you know, if you asked people about that, uh, well, you know, you can ask them with the flow probability, and then you could you could learn the gamma, right? So, so I agree. Um, you'd have to ask them those questions that involve specifying the the risk, though. But then it, uh, yeah, it could be a way to learn about gamma. I hadn't thought about it that way, but um, yeah, I, as I mentioned, but, I think it is a way I learned about my gamma. I, I I used to not know whether I was log or gamma equals two, and that first <laughs> calculation makes me think maybe I'm gamma bigger than two instead. Of so, log. what what's your gamma now? You know, macroeconomists are always one or two, so I'm two instead of one. But uh, I know my asset pricing friends tell me I need to be at least five, and you know, uh, I'm not sure. Or you have Epstein's in preferences. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but your attitude has your personal attitude towards adopting AI changed after I, these calculations? I think that that I have an instinct. So. so so I, I'd, I'd written a lot on this value of life in various ways. So, so I was primed to think life is incredibly valuable and that makes me pretty conservative. And so this bounded utility, I was very much open to. And so I thought, hey, if AI gives us rapid growth, I don't really care about that because I, I already have a good life. I don't need to double my consumption. I just need more time to enjoy my good life. And so I was pretty, pretty conservative about using the AI on the existential risk front already. So I would say the way it changed to me really is, the, is this last point, because, you know, if, if it's lives versus lives, then you're in the same units. This margin utility point is no longer relevant. And it does seem to me that I, I think if AI is going to be, here's, here's another way to say it. If AI is going to be good enough that it can kill off all of humanity, it's probably going to be good enough to invent lots of ideas that, you know, save lives. And so, um, that's the thing that I, I would say probably you know, surprised me the most and shifted my priors the most, which is maybe I should be more willing to try it just because, you know, if it lets everyone who lives live for twice as long, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty good. I, I think so let, me, I, let yeah. me push it a little bit harder in a sense. There is, of course, an optimal lifespan for society. If everybody lives twice as long because people become... Evolution is probably slowing down. I'm going beyond the model here. <laughs> uh, because new generations bring new ideas and they change things and start fresh. If we now live in a world where everybody just lives 300 years, it probably changes probably the growth rate too. But do you think we don't need it anymore because AI is anyway creating all the ideas? 
Yeah. The, the adjustment of society is, is different because you have a lot of old people then who might not change their rigid attitudes and they might not change to the new world. Yeah, so I, I think what I'd say about that is we've run this experiment already, right? So look at the world mm -hmm. in 1900 versus the world today. Yeah. Right in 1900, life expectancy was 50 years. That was it was mostly infant mortality. So mm -hmm. people condition on living to age 20, people kind of live to 60 or 70, mm -hmm. right? But but even life expectancy among people age 60 has has risen a lot in the last hundred years as well. Just just not as much. And so you know you know to, uh, you know 70 is the new 50 or something or you know. Yes. 50, uh, yeah, so 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 I do think we we've historically run this experiment, and the world seems like a better place with healthy sixty-five year olds running around. And so, you know, my, my view about life expectancy is that the last two years of life are hard, no matter when they occur, and we're pushing them further and further into the future. Now that runs into sharply diminishing returns. I think a, a fair question is maybe it's biologically impossible for us to live past one hundred and thirty or something. That you know. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I'd believe that because I think, you know, we're just machines and you can replace all our parts and then we can live a long time. But, you know, it, it is an open question. Um, so I, I think it probably does get harder and harder to extend life. And if you put lots of diminishing returns in there, that might make the existential risk, you know, uh, more important, I would say. Um, but, but, yeah. Very good. Thanks a lot. It's a very stimulating paper. It makes us think a lot. I'm mean, also thinking, you know, what else should be in the utility function and things like that, whether it should be only consumption. But uh, I think it opens a lot of questions and a lot of interesting research. Fascinating. Thanks a lot, yeah. John. Thanks very much, Marcus. I really appreciate uh, the questions and the opportunity to present. Great. Bye-bye.